We're looking tonight in a uh, chapter that is somewhat difficult as uh, a lot of revelation is uh, very interesting, very uh, uh, provocative in the way that it touches us, very uh, deep in a lot of the ways that it speaks to us in a manner that uh, that we need His help to be able to understand and comprehend a lot of the things. As we look in chapter 12 tonight, we're going to read the first five verses and uh, we're going to recognize a couple of things as we go through this that uh, when we start looking at heaven, we start looking at the things of God, we start looking at the throne room, we start we recognize that God through these things is teaching us and talking to us and showing us about the things that will uh, come to pass as well as at times things that have already come to pass. And he says here, beginning at verse 1 in chapter 12 in the book of Revelation, and there appeared a great wonder in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet and upon her head a crown of twelve stars. And she being with child cried travailing in birth and pained to be delivered. And there appeared another wonder in heaven and behold a great red dragon having seven heads and ten horns and seven crowns upon his heads. And his tail drew the third part of the stars of heaven and did cast them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman which was ready to be delivered for to devour her child as soon as it was born. And she brought forth a man-child who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron. And her child was caught up unto God and to his throne. We have a number of places in the book of Revelation where it speaks about a wonder. And there are at least two that it speaks about in this chapter when we look at this particular thing. Now, over the years, there have been a lot of people that have come up with all kinds of different ideas when you look at this particular woman. When they look at the things that it speaks of, uh, the, uh, the one thing that uh, often has taken place, it, the, the Catholic Church has often called it Mary, and sometimes there have been paintings that have been drawn with her with the moon underneath her feet and one thing or another, and different things like that, and paintings, and, uh, and, and a lot of different uh, ways that things have been described in one way or another. But as we begin to look in the Word of God, as we begin to look in uh, all over the Bible, from the beginning to the end, it is important for us to see some characteristics that, uh, that began to show themselves. We go back over into, I believe it's chapter 37 of the book of Genesis, and we see a young man, a small boy who lives at home and is the favorite of his father. His father made him a coat of many colors. And we see him as he has a dream about sheaves, and then he has another dream. And in that particular dream, he sees the sun and the moon and eleven stars bowing before him. Now we know the picture, and we know all about the things that occurred following that. We recognize that because of the envy of his brothers, that Joseph as he went out to find and see how his brothers were doing in the field, watching the, uh, the flock, taking care of the herd and the cattle and everything that was there, that, uh, that uh, they looked out and they saw him coming when they, were, uh, they had been removed from the place where he thought they were going to be. And, uh, they were told where he was. They, he t a man told him where they were at. So he went to that area and they said, well, let's take and let's kill this dreamer and we'll see what comes of his dreams. But the elder, Reuben, said, no, let's not kill him. They, they put him in a dry pit. And then he had to go off and do something. And while he was gone, his other brothers 
saw a group coming and says, well, we wouldn't have no profit that way. Let's just go ahead and sell into these. And so there were some Ishmaelites and Midianites who were traveling uh, toward Egypt that came along. And they pulled him out and they sold him. And eventually we recognized what took place and happened as uh, he went down there and was falsely accused and put in prison. And finally when Pharaoh had some dreams, there was... Uh, the, the one that was his cupbearer actually remembered that the dream uh, was interpreted by this young man who at this time was now over all of the prison as God had given him favor with the, with the warden. And so he brought him before Pharaoh and eventually his brothers came and his father came and, uh, and they... Uh, they bowed down before him as the ruler of Egypt. It was a picture of what was to take place. But in that dream, we see the picture that God is showing in this as well. As we see the moon, as we see the sun, as we see those particular things, and we, and we kind of get an idea about what it's speaking about. Throughout history, we have seen uh, different ones who desired and wanted to destroy the nation of Israel. Pharaoh is at, described in the book of Ezekiel as a dragon. Nebuchadnezzar at one place is described in scripture as a dragon. There are those that were involved in one way or another of trying to get rid of, of Israel. They were, there was a point in time where all of the sea royal, where the promise that came from God was that the sea of David, the Messiah, would come, that all the sea royal, all of those that were ready to, to uh, were uh, in line for the throne was killed except one little boy. Jehoash became king when he was seven years old. And done away with idols and all kinds of things while Jehoiada the priest was uh, was there with him. He grew up uh, serving and, and loving the Lord. And we go into the New Testament and we come to the place where uh, the baby was born in Bethlehem and where Herod attempted to destroy all the babies to get rid of any possibility. And after, when Judas betrayed the Master, when he uh, was a betrayer of Christ, it seemed that Satan thought that he had won the victory because Christ hung there on the cross and Christ died there. But the reality is that was the place where he was defeated forever. That was the reality of the cross. That was where the victory was won. That's where the battle was ended. That's where it was over with. But as, even though that is true, because the Savior came through Israel, Satan has already always hated Israel. And we have seen anti-Semitism throughout the world over and over again and an attempt to destroy and get rid of the Jews over and over again. And as we look at these scriptures, we see another attempt in that direction. But what I'm saying to you as I look at this, at this particular situation, and we look at this wonder in heaven, and we look at this woman clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet and on her head a crown of, of, of twelve stars, and she being with child, travailing in birth, and pain to be delivered. When we look at the situation, it can only be speaking about Israel. It can't be talking about Mary. Because Mary, the rest of the, of the things and the events that it shows here, makes it plain that it couldn't have been her. She didn't go into a wilderness somewhere and, and hide and all of those kinds of things and that kind of thing. The 11 stars, the 12 stars now, including Joseph, speaks about the 12 tribes. And it speaks about the, 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 those things as we look through those particular verses. And 
when we go down and we read about the, the man-child, and we'll skip over uh, verses 3 and 4 for just a moment, and she brought forth a man-child who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron. Well, over, uh, more than one place in Revelation, it speaks about Jesus ruling the nations with a rod of iron. It speaks about the millennial reign. It speaks about when Satan is taken out of the way, when he is chained, when he is in that pit, when he is not able to do anything at all about temptation. Still, on the earth, sin can occur, but Christ rules with a rod of iron with those that are a part of what he uses in his kingdom at that particular time. So those thousand year reign is before the final everything takes place where Satan is actually taken out and where the judgment finally occurs where he is cast into the lake of fire, where uh, death and hell are cast into the lake of fire, where he is, as it plainly says, uh, uh, in talking about the things that are to come. Now, we look at verses 3 and 4, and there's some very interesting things here. It speaks about, And there appeared another wonder in heaven, and behold, a great red dragon. I, I don't know how, how you all are, but you know, when I was a kid, we had this great big Bible. You know, they, it had a big picture of the devil in it, and he was in a red suit, and he had a pitchfork and all those kinds of things. Well, now that's somebody's artist rendition of it. But, uh, but the picture that we see of him speaks to us about who he is and what he is, what he is doing and what he has done and everything about that. You see, uh, we recognize what those uh, particular uh, words mean, what, what, the, what, it, what it, how it describes him. And because of what it speaks about him, as it calls him, that great dragon is cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceived, deceived the whole world. He was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. Now, when we began to look at this particular thing, and we began to see some of the things that it speaks about, uh, we're, uh, we're looking at uh, a, a great deal that has to do uh, with him. He speaks about he drew the third part of the stars of heaven. Now those stars of heaven is talking about the angel, the devil's angels. Okay? Uh, not the motorcycle group. Okay? We're talking about uh, the uh, we're talking about the demons that we, uh, that word that speaks about and calls them devils in the Bible. We're talking about those particular things. And uh, it's not talking about stars like we see the lights in the sky. Uh, over and over, uh, there are things here that are an allusion to other things and speaks to us about, about different things that deal with that and show us things that have to do with that. Now, as we look at that, we, uh, we, see, uh, we, we see what takes place with him. It says he... Before the woman was ready to be delivered, ready to devour, he wanted to get rid of the Christ before it could take place. And then after uh, he was, uh, the woman fled to the wilderness where she had a place prepared of God. Now these are, this speaks about events both past and present and future. It speaks about all of these things when we look at that. And we go on to this particular point. Now, you know, we have to think about a scripture that's found in the book of Luke as Christ was talking to those that he sent out. He sent them out to two by twos to uh, speak to those that were, uh, uh, that had, uh, well, he sent them out to, to heal and to uh, cast out devils and to do all kinds of things. And they came back in and they were excited because the devils were subject to them. And Jesus said, I beheld Satan like lightning fall from heaven. And there's a verse in there. If, you, um, if, you, if you've ever uh, particularly noticed that particular thing. Now, whether he was talking about a past event or a future event, Jesus saw it. And he knew uh, what had taken place. But as we... Look at this. It says, 
and there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon fought and his angels and prevailed not, neither was their place found any more in heaven. You know, it's interesting when we go in, there's things that sometimes puzzle us a little. We, uh, we read the book of Job, and uh, we read what it begins to say, and it says that the sons of God came and presented themselves before God and uh, before the Lord, and and it says, and Satan also came with them. Access, uh, it seems to us that it shouldn't be that way, that there should be no access. But as we look in the Word of God, it says that he stands and accuses the brethren before God. The accuser of the brethren. He's the, he's the opposing attorney. He's the one that says, I know what he did on this day. And so he's a bad guy. And Jesus defends and says, but I paid the price for him. I took his sins upon me. I shed my blood and washed him clean. And so as we look at those things, we, uh, we recognize that. There's a lot of times people then take this particular one. Of course, Michael uh, is an archangel. He is uh, the head of... Uh, of the angelic host, it seems, in, a, in the sense as we read it here. He is, uh, but as we go through these particular things, and a lot of times people try to describe him uh, as being Jesus. Well, the truth is that as we go through the Bible, that doesn't really bear record in that kind of way. If the devil can have his angels, so can another archangel have his, angel, his angels. It's not a, you know, and... Uh, you know, sometimes people take the scripture where it says that Jesus, that with the voice of the archangel in Second Thessalonians, and they and they speak about it in that wet manner. Well, you know, it's like uh, uh, somebody put it this way. They said, well, you know, God, uh, the Lord could use an archangel uh, to to speak in the same way that He can use a trumpet to speak. He's not the trumpet because He uses a trumpet. He's not in that sense of the word. And so they try to make it in a sense where Jesus is not God who came in the flesh, but Jesus is God who came in the flesh. He is part of the Trinity. And so when we look at those particular things, there are others that are called archangels and those kinds of things. And uh, Jude says that Michael wouldn't rebuke or accuse Satan on his own authority, but only say, the Lord rebuke you. And and, uh, of course, Jesus rebuked Satan on a number of different occasions, and we know uh, that uh, from, uh, from the Word of God. And so, when we look here, it says that the, the dragon fought and his angels and prevailed not, neither was their place found any more in heaven. He couldn't be in heaven anymore. And it says it was that the great dragon was cast out that old serpent called the devil and Satan, okay, uh, which deceiveth the whole world. He was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. And I heard a voice saying in heaven, Now has come salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ, for the accuser of the brethren is cast down, no longer able to accuse the brethren before God which accused him before our God day and night, and they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb, the blood of Jesus Christ, and by the word of their testimony, and they loved not their lives unto the death. Therefore rejoice, ye heavens, and ye that dwell in them. Woe to the inhabitants of the earth and of the sea, for the devil has come down unto you, having great wrath, because he knoweth that he hath but a short time. So he was cast out. Now, uh, the, the devil uh, is the master accuser of the brethren. That's who he is, and and uh, and, and that's and of course uh, the the name uh, has. There's two, two different names that's given to him, and both of them have a particular meaning behind it. The name devil means accuser, and Satan means adversary. Satan stands to 
uh, accused uh, and, uh, and to battle against in any way he can to prevent uh, the name of, uh, well, Christians from being able to present, pre present the Lord Jesus and, uh, and that name. And so we see the dragon saw that he was cast to the earth. He persecuted the woman which brought forth the man-child. Uh, uh, and at, uh, as we go through this, when you speak about the earth and you speak about the sea, you're speaking about nations and peoples and tongues. It tells us that as we go on over into the 17th chapter of the book of Revelation. It speaks to us and shows us what it's talking about. And if we, if we take it and reconcile all the different things that it says and speaks about in these things, uh, it says basically that what's going to take place, and we're going to look at it as we go further on into this because we see it beginning to happen, is what takes place is in the middle of the seven years, that final week, that 70th week of Daniel, where there's a split between. You have the 69 weeks, and you have the age of the Gentiles in which we are in right now, and you have the final week, which is the tribulation period. Because it's, it's 70 weeks of years, okay? That's what we're talking about. And so, at the beginning, somewhere along the line that, this, that we're going to be looking at as we go on further, as you have, you have the... Uh, uh, you have the devil himself, you have the prophet, you have the beast, okay? And all of those are a part of the situation. You have those that there is a charismatic leader that rises. He is the Antichrist. And he promises peace to Israel. And he somehow brings about a peaceful accord between them, them and those that are their roundabout enemies to the point that Israel actually will rebuild the temple in some way or another. I don't know exactly how that's going to occur, but it will because it speaks about it in that manner. And as they measured this morning, as we were looking at the measurement that John was to take, he measured the inner court, but not the outer. Well. There are those that feel like that outer court probably has something to do with those Gentile areas that are round about where the where the building where the the temple we will be built. But he makes that seven year guarantee of peace, but in the middle of it he breaks that peace. And from the way that it reads, as we look at it, there is a major. Um, campaign of anti-Semitism to try to destroy all of Israel. And of course in the end of it we see the battle that comes up and everything that has to do with that. But God protects them. Now as we look at this, that's what we're reading about as we see some of these things because it's hard to place everything in the right uh, time frame all the way through it. And so I'm, I'm I'm giving kind of an overview of what I'm talking about. But when the dragon saw he was cast out, he persecuted the woman which brought forth the man-child. And to the woman were given two wings of a great eagle that she might fly into the wilderness into her place where she is nourished for a time and times and a half time from the face of the serpent. That's three and a half years that it's talking about. The last three and a half. And the serpent cast out his mouth water as a flood after the woman that he might cause her to be carried away of the flood. Now when we talk about the waters, we talk about nations and peoples and tongues according to Revelation 17. So they were trying to destroy in whatever way. And the dragon was wroth with the woman and went to make war with the remnant of her seed which keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. So war, he, so while after he's cast out where he can no longer have access in heaven, he tries to destroy all those that believe in Christ on the earth. And now we've looked at those witnesses. We've looked at the 144,000 Jewish prophets 
uh, speakers, uh, those that uh, preach the gospel message, all of those things we looked at as we looked at uh, a couple of the chapters before this, and we recognized that as a result of the testimony of those with the seal of God in their foreheads, those uh, Jewish people that it speaks about at that point in time, that there are numerous uh, thousands and thousands who believe in Christ as a result of their testimony, as a result of what takes place there. And so we see uh, that final thing as it speaks about it here that he tries to make war with. Now, when it comes to the church, the devil has always tried to make those that were um, he does what he can to destroy the testimony of the church. And in that, what he does is, he tries to make it seem as though those who believe in Christ are dangerous. Well, let me tell you, they're doing that right now. They're saying, because they don't want anything to do with this, because they won't go along with what the world says is right because they stand on that book and what that book says that they are dangerous because they cause hate in the world. Christians aren't about hate. We're about love. We're about God. We're about a God of love. We're not about destroying people. We're about bringing people to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. We're about showing them truth. We're about making people understand that there is one way to God and they need to know that way. and They need to trust God and let it be a part of their life. And so, in all of these things, he is, it is his deception that tries to take what God does in the hearts of people and the message about God and turn it around and try to make it a message of hate, a message of, of wrong, a message that needs to be destroyed. He's always trying to destroy the message of God. But God's message is always about bringing everyone to a saving knowledge and to a relationship with Him. And so, anyway, this chapter is... Uh, one person said it's the most difficult chapter in the book of Revelation. Maybe it is. Uh, maybe there are things about it that are difficult to understand. And maybe there are things that none of us really fully and completely understand about it. And there is one thing for certain. It shows the winner. It shows what God has done. It shows what God is going to do that he protects his own. And in all of those things, we recognize the victory that is won because of Jesus Christ, and because of what he did on the cross. That's what it's about. All the way down, that's what it's about. It's about Jesus. So, uh, I hope that somewhere along the line, this has uh, been something uh, of interest to you if if nothing else that we've been talking about here tonight. Let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, we come to you now asking, Lord, that you just move and touch and meet every need. Lord, if there are those that are watching this that recognize their need of Jesus, Lord, I pray that you touch them as only you can in Jesus' name.